up with great skill from him. To win the Mosala! Dream Sterling! What a finish! What pure class from the Englishman! Premier Talk, the English Premier League podcast for the fans. Hello and welcome back to the Premier Talk podcast. I'm one of your two hosts, as always, Andrew Mello. Alongside with me is Danny B, Danny Barbudo. Daniel, episode 14 of season 14. three. We're going to call this one Coutinho Returns. And for good reason, Coutinho had a banging week this week in the Premier League. Fantastic match. Um, things are looking very good at Aston Villa right now. I love Aston Villa right now. The team looks nuts. Although the draw, although the draw this week wasn't exactly the result that they wanted, the players on this squad are going to be such a nice fit. I love Coutinho back in the prem. I love DJ on this side. I love it. Inject it into my veins. I love it. Daniel, you look hyped for that. Um, but but anyways, let's let's kick it off and let's get into the starting lineup here. Um, let's kick off with the games of the week. Then we're gonna go new segment, new segment alert potato of the week or as like i like as i like to say a patate the patate of the week and then we're gonna get into a, a to another segment um called player position changes so it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one kick us off games of the week we got two games on tuesday two games on wednesday february 8th and february 9th the first game and we're only talking about this because of how disappointing it was burnley versus manchester united 1-1 one, one draw. Absolutely mudded. This club is just mudded right now. We are a mudded club. We got Varane. He scored first. A few minutes in. I think it was like a 10th minute. He scored a goal. A lovely header, by the way, off a set piece. It would have been United's first set piece goal of the year, which is disgusting. He scored. It was ruled out by VAR because Maguire was coming from an offside position and banged into the defender. It was it was brutal. I was watching this game. I was snapping. I was literally snapping because when a player on a set piece, you always have the one player that starts in an offside position. They always come back onside. It happens at every single set piece. I don't understand why United was penalized for this. I, I didn't understand why VR intervened at all, to be completely honest. It was just brutal. Well, in my opinion, in that sequence, Maguire got pushed. He got pushed back onside. Um, he really didn't have a control, a complete control of his momentum really in that play. I thought it was pretty interesting how they overturned it. I was I was messaging you, Daniel, throughout the entirety of that game pretty much. And it was pretty funny because I would say, come on, United, like they scored and then goal overturn. Goal overturn. Come on, United, yeah. Pogba, foul, goal overturn. It was just a funny um, game for United. Another poor result. There were, there were some rumors swirling around. No, hang on, hang on. Going back. Pogba's goal, it wasn't. He got he, There was a foul, but they didn't actually overturn the goal. The one on Pogba, Pogba's goal was a goal. Okay. They were looking at it, but it was never actually overturned. No, there's one in the second half later on that he smacked. Oh, that. I can't remember who Stacey (laughs) smacked in the box. I can't remember who it was now. Um, Yeah, uh, it was thingy, and then uh, Cavani tapped it in. Yes, yes. That one was overturned. Yes, yes, yes. That was was the one I was talking about. But going back to what I heard in this week in in terms of news, they're comparing Ralph Ragnick's assistant coach, um, to the likes of Ted Lasso. I saw that. Former TFC man, too. For, former <laughs> Toronto FC manager. I don't understand how a TFC manager is in the Premier League, but that's a whole other story. Um, Poor Bruce, I man. saw that. Poor Bruce. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But anyways, moving on. Pugba gave Manchester United, like we said, 18 minutes in. It was a pullback from Shaw. Um, it was a nice pass, nice finish. Nothing really to complain about. And the whole first half, United had chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to score and to put this game to bed. Game would have been done. It would have been 2-0, 3-0. Game would have been over. Burnley would have had it home. That's it. But they didn't capitalize on their chance. Coming back from halftime, Jay Rodriguez, he scored in the 47th minute with a white horse assist, a new signing. And that tied the game right there. Like Malo said, there was the Cavani goal that was overturned because Pogba like, slapped the guy in the face accidentally but he did and uh one other talking point in this game Ronaldo got subbed on late for I believe it was for Cavani I think that's who they subbed him in for um he's on a five game drought right now and it's the longest in his career I think since like 2010 something ridiculous something stupid it's such a Ronaldo stat um the Manchester United effect yeah and he's been 
he hasn't been good when he's coming on, but like every single game he started, every single game he hasn't started, they've never won. I think that's the stat. Something ridiculous. Like he's he's such an important player on the side that like I don't understand how he's not starting. I don't yeah. get. It. I I mean, I was I was scratching my head again to not see Ronaldo in the lineup. Um, it was just another week where you, you could have had him in there and you could have had him starting, uh, you know, with alongside the the likes of Rashford and Sancho. And, mm-hmm. you know, Cavani is a great player, but he's not Ronaldo. Even at yeah. 37, he's not Ronaldo. And Ronaldo just has an effect on the game, the ability to, you know, draw away defenders, create space for his wingers. Because um, that, that's the presence he brings to this team. Mm-hmm. And for him not to be starting, it's, it's another frustrating uh, moment, I guess, for him and a lot of United fans. Because that's the reason why they brought him in to be that guy, um, and, and right now he, he's not finding himself in, in the lineup against teams like Burnley and these lower side teams. When I think he should be playing regardless, because it's the Premier League. So mm-hmm. put your best lineup out there week in week out. Yep, I completely agree. Anyways, that was a blunder by United. There they picked up the one point, which doesn't help him in the top four race. Burnley sitting in relegation helps them massively, picking up one point against a team like United. Anyways, done talking about that. Newcastle Everton. Yo, Kieran Trippier, man. He had a game. Kieran Trippier, game and a half. Everton, I believe, is like 16th or 17th, and Newcastle is sitting just inside relegation, 18th. Um, Newcastle came out, won this one, 3 1. There was an own goal from each side, <laughs> just a minute yeah. apart. It was Jamal Lasalle scored one in his hand, then he got the, the equalizing goal a couple of minutes uh, <laughs> later. Um, yeah. No, but it, it was it was an own goal on that one too. That one was an own goal too. Yeah, but it was it was Lascelles. It was Lascelles. Yeah. It was Lascelles. Anyways, so he kind of contributed in both goals, except the one was in his own net. It was one one, thirty seven minutes in. Then you got Ryan Frazier coming into this Newcastle side this year for Burnmouth, and he put Newcastle ahead in the fifty sixth minute, and then Kieran Trippier with a lovely free kick. The free kick was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous free kick. He sealed the three points in the 80th minute, gave Newcastle a massive three points in the relegation uh, stint. He was also responsible for the cross on the LaSalle's goal, if we want to credit LaSalle's with it in the first half. So uh, mm-hmm. a very talented set-piece specialist, and he's he brings something that Newcastle was missing in terms of the set-pieces. Um, uh, additionally, he brings some leadership back there as well. So I think the fit so far for, for Kieran has been good. I think it's been the right mm-hmm. fit for him in Newcastle, um, coming back into the Premier League and trying to reestablish himself in the Premier League. And for Newcastle, just a massive, massive win. Uh, for Everton, it's two L's under Frank, Frank Lampard. Frank Lampard, yeah. So it's not, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be a tough, it's not, I'm, I'm not blaming Frank, I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming Frank. Um, it's just a tough, tough situation for any manager to come in, step in into that uh, environment and try to change things mm-hmm. around. It's gonna be very difficult for Frank. So it's gonna be, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Very interesting. Another massive game. These ones, these two games happen on Wednesday, February 9th. We've got Tottenham versus Southampton. Southampton won this one 3-2 after Tottenham was leading 2-1 70 minutes in. we got Bednar scoring an own goal in the 18th minute, putting Tottenham up 1-0. And then Broja. Broja. What a great name. He equalized five minutes later. Southampton. That kid is underrated, man. He's so He's good. So, good. so talented. Such a good hold up striker with with a great ability to play the ball um and score the ball i'm just i'm just hoping chelsea you know brings him back because he belongs to chelsea he's on loan right he's now on loan. Mm-hmm. um the albanian man he's got he's got some potential that kid man he's got some real potential i've been watching him play and he's always he always finds himself impacting the game in one way or another and i really like the way he plays very very uh hungry attitude he brings to the mm-hmm. game i really like it yeah, I completely agree with you. And then we got Tottenham. So at this point, it was with that Broja equalizer, 1-1. Kingman's son, he scores for Tottenham. Looking like Tottenham's going to go on to win the game. They're up 2-1. In the 79th minute, you got El Yanusi scoring. And then in the 82nd minute, you got Che Adams scoring. And that puts Southampton up 3-2. And then nuts. the latest drama ever. And this guy loves late drama. Steven Bergwijn. He scored what looked to be an equalizer. Nuts. Everybody's going nuts. I love when he scores late goals. It's fantastic. Last That's, couple so weeks, sad, going, That's so sad, though. That's so sad. Like, Tottenham's going like nuts. They're it. going nuts to, like, tie tie game they just blew. Like, a lead, a mm-hmm. lead blew. That's just the – that's the mentality right now for Tottenham. 
just but but if you look at it like they're not even doing that poorly because like they still have a few games in hand because of the the big covid situation yeah and if they win a few games they could easily easily rival top four easily yeah but then they're dropping points here down that's my problem with this club and then you know for them to go and score uh, the quote-unquote equalizing goal which uh, you know it ended up being overturned and Mm -hmm. go that nuts after you blew a game just shows just shows the level of the club. I mean, Conte likes going nuts when they score to make it one nothing five minutes into the game. Yeah, and then he, he was celebrating when they're up, <laughs> and then a couple <laughs> minutes later they're, they're losing. I was I thought it was hilarious. Oh, that that was guy's funny. nuts. That guy's a nut job. <laughs> I love him though. What a great manager. And that was it for the Southampton Tottenham game. Crucial points drop for Tottenham. And moving on to the last game of the week. Best game of the week. Best, Best game, of, game the week. of the week. This was a banger of a game, man. Aston Villa versus Leeds. This one ended 3-3. Vintage Felipe, man. Vintage. Vintage Felipe. And you see Dan James just oozing confidence. I love it. Yeah. Where was Anyways. he for United? Where was he for United, man? Uh, he? he was a little pacey little rat around, like to run up the sidelines. And that's about all he did. He scored a couple goals here and there. He usually got something late when they were winning like 9-0. Like we did against Southampton, and then we just scored one. And he wasn't getting the minutes, though. He was getting, he's getting out. He was not. At least he plays every game now, basically. Yeah, he's a focal point, especially with Patrick Banford not firing the way he was uh, Mm -hmm. last season. Last year. Yeah. So he's definitely picked up the slack for for Banford. And Dan James was the one to kick off the scoring in this one in the ninth minute. Lovely strike through the legs. I believe it was Kwanza. Nice finish. It's a lovely finish. And then you got vintage Coutinho. He scored in the 30th minute. Man, that touch. That touch top box. That was gross. Oh, Just lovely. Settled it so neatly. He's he, he got his body back over on the ball and cross school. Man, what a finish. What a neat finish. <laughs> and the commentary was A1 steak sauce. <laughs> A1 steak. It was nuts commentary. It was that, nuts. I love that guy. The he announcer. sprinkled his Brazilian <laughs> magic all over Villa Park. Yeah. <laughs> that was nuts. Um, and then continue after his goal. He assists Jacob Ramsey twice in five minutes, 38th minute, and 43rd minute. The both passes were st- stupid. They were Literally. the first one was a ridiculous through the ball. Vision. The second one was just vision. a vision of him waiting for Ramsey to overlap him, and he did. Um, both those goals. And we Ramsey... thought that yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go no, no, go. I was go gonna on. say Ramsey's not a striker, man. And this guy knows how to finish. He, he's he got a great ability to finish the ball and you know, if he wasn't, I, I like the if he wasn't on the map at the start of the season, he is now. That guy's a fantastic mm-hmm. player. I wouldn't be surprised if you know by the end of the season, a top six clubs looking for him. Hopefully, mm-hmm. he stays around because this this duo between him and Felipe right now is just looking just, dangerous. Yeah, they're dangerous, man. His second finish, I liked, like because I know as a striker when I'm running and you have a a defender coming across mm-hmm. goal, I look at either two things: finishing short post, which a lot of players don't like to do especially because the goalie is usually leaning that way mm-hmm. or trying to put the ball through the defender's legs when he stretches across and he just no hesitation ripped it short post top shelf. Yeah. It was, it was nuts. It was, it was a lovely finish. And then after that, to put them up three, one, you thought this, this first half couldn't get any more of a, any more ridiculous. Dan James scores again. It was not a great goal. The ball bounced up and it, he was just standing underneath it on the goal line, waiting to header it in. And he got, yeah. Scrappy Basically goal. sandwich. Scrappy. Scrappy. But a goal is a goal. And uh, it was 3-2 at this point. And then you got Diego Lorente, the big center back. He scores off just garbage. Daniel, but it was, just... it was a goal line clearance. So I'm not yeah. even going to... It was a goal line clearance I mean, for me. He's falling back, but he just scuffed it. And it just... just It was supposed Landon. to be clearance out of the box. And it just landed right to the feet of Lorente. I think Tyron Mings really costed um, Villa three points here. I think he could have clear, He could have done a better job. I think he could have done a better okay. job of clearing the ball. Um, and just two out of the three goals for Leeds were these scrappy goals um, and lack of man marking in the box and clearing mm-hmm. of the ball. Like it, it's it's poor, Daniel. It's poor because it really undermines the performances of Felipe uh, Coutinho and, and Ramsey because they, mm-hmm. they had a fantastic game and they really helped this team on the offensive side of the game. But, you know, in terms of the defensive aspect of the game, it was very poor inside the box. I don't know. I, 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 that's what I think costed the uh, Villa three points here. I think Kansa did because I was, think, yeah, I know it was later on in the game. I know at that point it was already three, three silly challenge, stupid, yeah, just dumb. like so unneeded. For those of you who didn't, Kansa was already on a yellow, and then Meslier caught the ball off a set piece, and then Kansa just grabbed him by like 
the neck, like yeah. upper chest area, and just dry into the floor. Because he like tried, absolutely the, the no reason. tried to play quick. Try to play quick. Yeah, and he was stopping yeah. a counter attack. Yeah. And then Konza couldn't believe that he got a second yellow for that. Like he was, st- he stood there in awe. Like it wasn't the easiest yellow the refs ever made, ever given his entire career. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. Anyways, those are the four games of the week. Four ridiculous games. I know we only kind of talked about United team, United game because they're in the mud, but whatever. I love people. People on the to, graphics. Daniel, Hang on, I got to... I got to shout out some fans in Fair Talk. Who was it? I think it was. I'm gonna shout out. I don't even know who it was. I think it was Austin. Shout out Austin Deacon. If you listen to the podcast, this guy comments. Barbs, don't you love making graphics for United when they blunder games like this? And I was ready to throw my phone out the window. <laughs> I was, I was so angry. I was making this graphic. I was like, "Oh my god, these guys are losing to or tying to Burnley." Anyways, it's shout tough, out right? Austin it's, for it's that, tough right that now. comment. It's tough right now. Eh? It's, it is tough. It's, it's a tough, shout tough out, time. You know, I want to shout out my club, Chelsea. One nil, one nil, scrappy win for the Club World Cup, FIFA Club World Cup, uh, out in Dubai. I can't believe Prem around. teams are in that. You know. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the formatting for the for the um, Club World Cup. It's it's always usually the big team in Europe that wins it. Um, yeah. Rarely, I don't I don't even know the history of it. I'm not. I don't think. I don't. There's, I don't yeah. There's maybe Europa League once. Yeah, I don't know, but it's just very. I don't know. I don't. It's know a weird format. I don't know why they would even make. I don't know. It's it's for me. It's like. It's like a useless trophy that you get the fans to go, oh, we got another trophy. Like, wow, you're playing Al Jaber in Saudi Arabia. Like, why is that? Why are you regarding that as a massive trophy? It shouldn't be. Yeah. Anyways, anyway, it's a whole other story. Daniel. New segment time. New segment of the week. New segment for the for the for the podcast in general. You know, we were brainstorming. We were brainstorming. A little Up, bit. Up we we got a new segment <laughs> called Potato of the Week, man. Uh, pata- potato of the Week. For those of you it. listening, you know, well, what's a potato? What's a potato <laughs> of the week? You know, we're talking about a couch potato. Like, you know, had a bad performance, you know, during the news for all the wrong reasons. So yep. That that's sort of the criteria we're looking for, for potato of the week. And there was there was many candidates for this week. We oh, there was that, there was the console that we mentioned earlier, but yeah. Daniel Consa. Who, who Harry you Maguire, with? you go with Harry Maguire. Gabriel. No, no, no. Consa, Harry Maguire. Both, all three of these players are just muddy this week. <laughs> They're just ridiculous. You got Harry Maguire doing absolutely nothing against. <laughs> what did that guy do? He did absolutely nothing, and he was the reason why they scored. Yeah, Whitehorse got, absolutely destroyed him. You got Consa. Yeah, Whitehorse. He's like six eight. He's dripping around Maguire like Maguire is in a fridge, going up against the fridge. But yo, David A made a massive save on him in the second half. Crazy save. That volley? Yeah, that was not 32. That was good. Um, so we got Maguire. We got, for just being invincible the entire game, we got Kansa for his second yellow for just dragging down Mesley for no reason. And then you get Gabriel Martinelli. I, I'm going to have to go with Martinelli. I'm going to have to go with Martinelli too. You know, a lot of two yellows in the same yeah. play. You know, a lot of fans were, were complaining about the double yellow card for the same play. But for the, for, you know, for once in a long time, a referee's made a fantastic ref, ref, fantastic. ref had to go like this after the game. Yeah, fantastic Adding decision by Michael Oliver. Um, it was it was Arsenal and Wolves, a critical critical game. Um, Arsenal obviously they're sitting in fifth now with that win. They retain that position. Wolves just are right behind them in eighth. It was like a four point difference. Um, now I think after that game. But it, it was it was a game that either teams would have loved to win because they're fighting mm-hmm. for Europa League places. They're fighting for your uh, you know a place in Europe for next season. Both teams are really trying to step it up here after the the January window. Um, so so there's a lot of stake yeah with here. Arsenal's zero here. signings. They love it. A lot of stake here. Um, One nil. Gabriel put them up. Uh, the center back, the Brazilian center back, put them up. And so there was a, there's a play where Wolves was really starting to go to momentum, man. But that's one for the throw-in. Martinelli, similar to a concert that he pushed, pushed them. He pushed them. Um, but then still got it off the throw-in, found his way to Chiquinho, the new Portuguese signing. Um, Chiquinho, lovely, lovely footwork, got got you know, found the space, and Martinelli caught up to him and just went right through the back of him. Down. So 
I thought it was a fantastic call to give him two yellows and mm-hmm. then a red. I agree. Because one stupid challenge on the throw, and you can't do the Academy Pina throw, and the way he did even push them down was terrible. So mm-hmm. definitely yellow card on that. And then to chase after him, not even challenge the ball. He just chopped him to stop the play and a goal-scoring opportunity, which which it was. Um, mm-hmm. so I yeah, thought it was a fast break. Fantastic. Yeah, it was a fast break. So I thought it was a fantastic mm-hmm. call. And for me, Gabriel Marinelli he's my batata, my potato of the week, man. Batata of the week. Yeah, I, I agree with you. He was it was it was two dumb challenges. Two dumb challenges was the push. Okay, if you're gonna go and try to take a purposeful yellow, get the ball. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's that simple. You know you're going to, to to stop a fast break, so get the ball. Rip the ball out of his hands. Take the yellow card for that. If he's gonna do that, sure, it's still pretty dumb, but you're saving your team from a fast break. Then when you don't get the ball and he still gets a thrown off. You chase the guy down 30 yards and then you take his legs off from behind. Stupid. 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 And it's childish. It just goes to show you the maturity level because it's a critical game. Like we said before dying Mm -hmm. stage of the game, there's about like 15 to 20 minutes to play at that time. I can't remember the exact minute right now, but he went in and he made a stupid tackle and risk getting a, you know, red card. And just to see his reaction. Oh, he stood there. He did nothing wrong. He didn't, he didn't acknowledge it. Second yellow comes out. He's starting to question things. And then he saw the red. And that's when it registered in his brain. He's like, yeah. uh-oh. And he tried arguing. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's not much he could have you know, he could have yeah. said or done. Because the call mm-hmm. was absolutely correct. Um, fans that say it wasn't two yellow cards for the same player are delusional. They don't know the game. Um, that That's just it's just facts. So, um, great call there. And he's definitely my potato of the week. Potato of the week. And that is a brand new segment. Patate of the week. Thank you, Gabriel Martinelli, for starting us off. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel Martinelli. Uh, it's looking like there's going to be an award for the end of the season, the potato of the potato potato of the year. Potato of the year, and it's going to go to Maguire. It's probably going to go to Maguire. Let's be real. <laughs> probably. Uh, okay. Anyways, another another nice segment here. Player position changes, Daniel. So, in honor of Joelington, the Brazilian from Newcastle, changing from the striking position. To playing as an eight, very weird, weird, very unorthodox, very unconventional change. Um, reminds me of you know Ronaldo changing from his early days. The Brazilian Ronaldo changing from goalkeeping to to being a striker. What a fantastic change that was. Um, but nonetheless, this has inspired this segment and its player position changes, um, where players have made the move from a certain position that didn't favor their play to a position that they excelled in. Daniel, why don't you start us off? Kicking us off, we got Vincent Company. A lot of people don't know this. To be honest with you, I knew very little about this myself. Company was a midfielder. And then switching to a center back role, like again, like Joelington, it's just unorthodox. It's like as a center mid, you're good at everything. You kind of you're good at passing the ball, dribbling the ball. You have a little bit of pace to you, which you know company didn't really have much of. He was good at the he was decent at defending. He had good a good strength, a good body physique. And then all of a sudden, center back. And look where that turned out. Because he's probably regarded as a legend of Manchester City. Probably an icon of the game. And just a great change. Just a great change for this player. Daniel, next up we got the legend. The Man United legend. Antonio Valencia. Daniel, the Ecuadorian before making his move over to Manchester United. uh, He played for Wigan. Played for Wigan, and he was a winger, <laughs> and he also played a little bit of a little bit as a winger when he when he moved over from Wigan to United. He even won the uh, what's the award here? The Matt Busby Player of the Year award, which is a fantastic uh, and esteemed award for mm-hmm. Manchester United players. He won that, but Daniel, in in fifty three matches played, uh, he had eight goals and fourteen assists as a winger. It's not the best of not stats, great. but Daniel he switched it over and he ended up being. A very hardworking right back. Um, uh, uh, he, you know, he sort of fit that model of the new fullback, the new modern day fullback, where mm-hmm. the fullback not only defends but you know joins the attack, creates the width for for the team, and you know helps drive the team forward along the flanks. And he was he was one of those guys that I think of oh as you know one of those you know pioneers to the to become an admirer. Yeah. So Daniel, what a fantastic change of position um, for Antonio, and um, you know it was so tough to see him go because. For such a long time, he was that guy for United, uh, you know, a leader. He was a beast. And just a a hardworking player that put his all into every single challenge. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I loved Valencia. He was so good at that fullback position. He was nuts. He was beside, like beside you said, he was Vidic a, too. Oh my god! Yeah, look at that team. They had Vidic, Rio, Valencia, Evra, oh. Evra. Uh, oh, team's filthy. Anyways, he was really good at that. He was really good at what he did, and he was a leader because he captained this side with legends and icons of the game. Yeah. If you think, if you look at that team that he captained, and he captained, I don't even know how many years he kept it for. A couple years, like well, how many years? Maybe four or five. Anyways, he captained the side with just legend after legend and to show how he changed from a winger to a wing back is nuts and like you said probably one of the pioneers as to why the fullbacks press up the field so high nowadays why they get into the attack they're amazing at passing and dribbling it's not just all about pace and defending anymore it's not what it's about and he was just a phenomenal player for manchester united daniel next up the third one probably probably the, the most well-known one, yes. I would like to think. Yeah. You got Gareth Bale going from a left back to a right winger. He played 45 games as a left back and 207 games as a right winger. And over his 207 games as a right winger, he had 89 goals, 55 assists, and he won the UCL four times. Yeah, beast. Beast, beast. man. He, you know, he, he was just that guy for Tottenham. When he came, mm-hmm. when he made the move over from Southampton, um, where he started his career, and it was just a fantastic move at the time. He really fit in well with that Tottenham side, and I just remember how overpowered that left foot was because yep. he had an ability to swiftly cut inside and fire shots off, just like Iron Robin, another fantastic winger, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just unstoppable. And he made his move over to Real Madrid. It was the right move for him at the time, and. You know, it hasn't panned out these last couple of years, but, you know, looking back, I'm sure a lot of fans could look back fondly because he was just so dominant with Ronaldo and so dominant with Benzema uh, at his time in Real. Um, just a fantastic servant to that club as well. And uh, he he played a major role in several of the Champions League finals, uh, most notably that bicycle kick he scored uh, in the UCL final mm-hmm. uh, against Liverpool. So he just had a fantastic... Um, career at Real and just making that change uh, into becoming a winger was just the right move for him. And it's really, really paid out. Mm -hmm. I saw one thing today on social media, which I just want to ask you about quickly. It was, who would you choose in their prime? Listen to this one. You have Gareth Bale, Mm -hmm. Mo Salah, or Neymar. That's a tough one. And I can't lie to you. It was a really good question. Really good question. Because if you look at Salah, he's probably in his prime right now. We don't know, but most likely. He's most likely in his prime, prime years right now. Neymar's prime years were when he was at Barcelona. Yeah. And he was a demon at Barcelona. He was, he was. And then you got Gareth Bale when he was at Madrid. I would, Daniel, I would have to go. This is a great question, but I'd have to go with Gareth. I'd go with Gareth just because, one, attitude was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Attitude was fantastic. And I think that's something that Neymar really lacked in the mindset. Number two, physicality. This guy was a beast, bro. He brought a physicality to the game like like not many wingers. Because unlike Aaron Robin, he he brought physicality. He brought uh, you know that strength and control uh, to mm-hmm. his game um, that players like Aaron Robin you know like they're more finesse players and more crafty players, right? Um, and then he also brought skill. He brought a lot of skill mm-hmm. to the game, and um, he was very timely in you know jumping into a game and changing the game. Because when mm-hmm. Ronaldo and Benzema were shut down, he was there to help out. Um, and he was just fantastic to watch. I love seeing him in his prime. Fantastic player. I can't say I agree with you, but I think I have a little bit of bias here just because Neymar was one of my favorite players growing up watching Barcelona like week in and week out. Um, for me, he was one of the best wingers to do it. Skills, pace, shooting was way better than it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, passing was incredible. I don't know. He was just a phenomenal player for me. And that MS sense with Messi, Suarez, Neymar was just gross. Yeah. Anyways, moving on to the fourth and final. Mello, what do you think? Last but not least, you know, he's never was a Premier League player. But with that being said, he's a Premier League manager now and arguably the best of all time. Oh, it's none other than yeah. Joseph Pep Guardiola. 
Um, Josep. <laughs> uh, Pep um, started his footballing off as a winger, oddly mm-hmm. enough. Which I and didn't know. The story, as it's told, is that Johan Cruyff saw him playing the legend. Johan Cruyff saw him playing as a winger, and he said to the coach, "What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? This man needs to be playing in front of the defense." Uh, distributing the play, and that's what the coach ended up doing. He switched them off. Uh, he put him in that position, and boy, what a move it was! And what mm-hmm. a, you know, Johan Cruyff, what an eye for the game that man has. R.I.P. Uh, such a legend. Really knew the game and understood the game like not many people, like just no a, other. Just, yeah, just an mm-hmm. amazing football mind, and uh, similar to that of Peps and. He recognized the ability in Pep and he changed him and told him mm-hmm. to play uh, that position. And, you know, it's revolutionized that position for Barcelona. And he was, uh, you know, in a long line of great sixes for that club. And, you know, mm-hmm. now Sergio Busquets, op- uh, you know, occupies that same position. Um, and it's been a very integral part of that system in Barcelona where the six, you know, disrupts play, recuperates the ball and distributes to, distributes, to the rest of yeah. to the rest of his team. And that's what Pep did. He wasn't a flashy guy that scored tons of goals. No, um, he was the guy that would get the dirty work done and would go unnoticed a lot of the time. And um, he was, you know, an important reason to to why Barcelona had the success they did when he was there. Um, mm-hmm. It's not always those fancy, skillful players that uh, deserve the credit. It's guys like Pep, guys like Busquets that you know play these uh, positions that are of great importance. And the six is, you know, a very, very important position. Uh, in any sort of formation you play, whatever formation it is. Um, and he's that anchor, and he was that yep. anchor. So fantastic move uh, in terms of his position. I don't know if this story is true, but I got to tell you if it is, with Cruyff telling a manager to switch Pep to a, That's a, cool story. To a CDM, is the coolest thing I've ever heard. It's actually nuts. Like showing how well Cruyff understood the game is just nuts. It's crazy. And it turned out, Pep turned out to be an icon of the game. And now he's probably going to go down as one of the best managers of all time. So just that parallel there is, is incredible. It's honestly incredible. Daniel, that about wraps it up for this episode. Episode 14 of Permatalk Podcast. We are Hello. buzzing as always. Yes, we are. I love Daniel. podcast. I love yeah. it. You love it. Is. You gotta love it. Follow us Daniel. on socials. They have to. Andrew, tell the people. But get get followed. Premier Talk official, man. Our graphics. Premier Talk. Our, our graphics department has been going hard, man. They're going hard. Yeah. Our graphics. Shout out Julius Rufo with those graphics. We yeah, love shout, out <laughs> shout out Rufo for the graphics. We pay him. We pay him too much for his graphics, guys. Yeah. We do. Let's do that. We gotta revise that. We gotta revise that. <laughs> Anyways, that about wraps it up for this episode. Thanks for tuning in once again, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Take care, everyone. See you later.